Would you open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible? Genesis chapter 4 is our text. We're in the series of the Genesis Revival, and our hope and prayer is to read through the whole book of Genesis throughout this year and to receive nourishment from God's Word so that God can begin to do some new things in us, new beginnings, uh, new wineskins, amen? New wine and new wineskins, and we're excited for what God is doing. And today is chapter 4, uh, and I'm going to invite Sister Angie to come and help us read. If you have found Genesis chapter 4, please say Christ-likeness. Uh, would you rise with me then as we read God's Word together? I'll read the first verse, and you can read the second, and we'll rotate in reading, and Angie is going to help the congregation read. On the final verse... Let's read together. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer over the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Ered, and Ered was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Lamech married two women, one named Adah and the other Zillah. Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jupal. He was the father of all who play the harp and flute. Zillah also had a son, Tubul Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Nema. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech's 77 times. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take your seats. Thank you, Sister Angie, for helping us read the word of God this morning. Let us pray.
Father of all creation, we thank you for your word. And in Jesus' name, would you help us by your spirit to receive the seed of life, the word of truth. Help us to be alert and awake. Grant us the courage and the will to apply your word into our lives. For your glory and for our joy, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you in this room have ever received a gift? If you have, raise your hand. Received a gift? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, we, we like to receive gifts on our birthdays and Christmas and whatever occasion, anniversaries. Uh, but one present that I've received as a father that's been meaningful to me, and I want to share that with you today, is a card that my son wrote for me a couple of years ago. And uh, with his lovely handwriting, before he knew how to write well, he says, thank you for being my daddy. Happy birthday. And not only that, he, he drew a picture, and I think it's better than a Picasso myself. Uh, uh, it's, it's a fire with somebody. Uh, I think that's his daddy. Uh, his daddy looks quite peculiar. Uh, roasting marshmallows on a campfire, and there's a tent, and obviously it's kind of like a camping theme that he uh, drew for his daddy. And I keep this card on my uh, desk in my study at home, and I often just look up to it and enjoy the gift uh, that my son gave to me a couple of years ago. What you may not know is that when my son was born, uh, he had a particular condition which made him to be rushed from Beverly Hospital to Boston Children's the day he was born because Beverly could not figure out that something that was in him was not right. And so he was rushed and they found out that he had a particular condition called pyloric atresia where his intestines, it wasn't going through, there was a kind of a muscle that had grown and so they had to operate on him. And they said to us, it's like a one in a 100,000 case and it's very rare and you need to, you know, get it, you know, get an operation for it right away. So my wife and I, uh, we, we asked the medical team, with all due respect, we are Christ followers, and we fear God, and we want to pray, and so would you give us 24 hours to, to pray? And by God's grace, though they were not too happy with what we had requested, they said, yeah, you can pray for 24 hours. So I remember praying in the hospital room with all the doctors and nurses. I said, can we all hold hands? And, and, I, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, and then we just felt at peace that the Lord, he could heal instantly. Can I get an amen? amen? But he could also heal through the medical staff, the doctors and nurses God has given wisdom to. And we felt comfortable uh, that the operation should go ahead. And so he was in the operating room for about eight hours. And um, just thinking about, you know, what this little one was going through with all the tubes and with all the things going into his body. Uh, but at that time, as I was waiting in the room, um, there were other parents in that big, big room waiting for their children. And I, somebody came to me and said, aren't you Elisha? I said, yes, how do you know me? Well, uh, my husband goes to the seminary and you look familiar. And I said, wow, why are you here? And then she explained what was going on with her son. And then the Lord uh, really tugged on my heart to pray for this family. So we prayed in the waiting room, Lord, would you heal Touch, make whole this boy that's in the surgery room right now. Now, if you think about how the Lord has healed my son, and he's still living today by God's grace, and how he would be able to say, thank you for being my daddy, you understand the heart behind it, which makes it such a valuable gift to me. It might be a piece of paper for you, but to me, it is a son that which was almost dead that God raised to life. And that son speaks of his love for his daddy. And I believe that's the love of God coming through my son, Leo. Thank you for being my daddy. And I say to him, thank you for letting me be your father. And Yesterday, as I was just hugging him and saying, we got to praise God. we got to praise God. He has given you life. He has given me life. 
And I so enjoy our time together, Leo. This moment is precious. And by God's grace, I I pray that you would also experience this kind of joy, not thinking about too much about the things ahead or dwelling on the past too much, but being able to enjoy God's presence in the relationships that God has blessed you with with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your aunties and uncles. Of course, the crazy uncle that's always in the family. Love them too. Love them too. Today, I want to share a message that is entitled, A Better Sacrifice. And I want to dive into three particular themes and topics the theme of two brothers, the theme of two worshippers, and the theme of two destinies. There are two brothers that are mentioned here in Genesis chapter 4, and as long as, as far as I can see in the Bible, they are the first siblings. Two brothers. The first named Cain, the second named Abel. And many of you know this story. How many of you know this story? Almost all of you know this story. Uh, but let me just you know, help you to understand the background here. Adam and Eve have been commanded inside the Garden of Eden to eat from any tree, including the tree of life, but not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent comes, and Satan uses this vessel, the serpent, to tempt Eve, and Eve falls for it. And Eve gives some of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil to uh, the husband, And then they get found out, and then they are banished. But also God gives them a promise that a a son of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. It is a a messianic, it is a, a, a prophecy that God gives of redemption and sacrifice, of, uh, of what God was going to do. Now, we come to chapter 4, and we find very quickly what Adam and Eve do after they get banished. In verse 1, it says, Adam lay with his wife. In other words, they made love. That's what married people are supposed to do. Can I get an amen? Amen. Under the grace of God, under the love of God, under the holy matrimony of God. Making love, glorifying him for the purpose of what? To be prosperous. To have children, praise the Lord. She became pregnant and gives birth to Cain. Now, you might think, well, this is just, you know, a a verse, and and look what Eve Eve says about this particular uh, uh, happening. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And you might say, wow, Eve, uh, you've committed a great sin, but it seems like now you've kind of softened your heart. The Bible doesn't tell us if Adam and Eve ever repented of their sin. And I want to present to you an idea. Because for the longest time, I've read the text and I've studied it. And I thought, well, that's just Eve giving praise to God for a son. But perhaps Eve made a mistake because the name Cain means acquired. I have acquired from the Lord. Maybe Eve thought this was the promised son that God talked about in Genesis 3.15. Perhaps Eve thought this Cain, the son that I have acquired, will be the Messiah. But you all know the story. Eve is not holding the Messiah. He, she's holding a future murderer of her own son Abel. Sometimes we misunderstand the cues of God because we are not aligned with the will of the Father. We are not aligned with what the Spirit of God is doing in our day. Perhaps for you and I even, we might sometimes take the word and say, this is mine, but it wasn't for you in this particular season. Maybe we have our own understanding and we have an idea that God is the God for me that he has to do what I want him to do. But if you really look into it, does that mean you serve him or he serves you? A challenging idea. But at the end of the day, Eve thinks that this is going to be the promised child, the Messiah. But as she's raising this boy with Adam, she finds that there's something just not right. 
something so self-centered and so selfish and so sinful. And we'll find later when we get to the two worshipers of what happens in the background. On the other hand, Abel. What is the meaning of Abel? This name suggests something about his destiny. Because this, this name, Hevel, or Hevel, it's, it's how it appears, and it means passing, like passing through or fleeting. Abel's life, his name, points to a, a passing, a fleeting. And since passing has correlation with time, it is also the Hebrew word which is used to describe a very short period of time. Like our lives are a vapor, right? Here one minute, gone the other. In Ecclesiastes, we, we learn that uh, the, the wise man says, everything is meaningless. It's the same root. Hevel. It's something that's passing. Now, you hear about these two brothers and the sibling rivalry, and if you've ever had brothers or sisters, you probably understand what this means. The, you know, there's always this big brother or big sister who's always better than you. You run, and they're faster than you. You study, and they're better than you. You sing, and they sing better than you. And you always have some kind of rival rivalry with them. And it's, it's an embedded thing because there is sin in this world. Comparison. Why him? Why not me? Why did they get that when I got this? Especially when you receive gifts at Christmas. You open yours up and you're like, oh, this is nice. But then you kind of look over at your brothers or your sisters. Oh my goodness, they got a better one. <laughs> I remember, uh, I think it was my fourth Christmas back in Korea. And I, I, I I went to this like nursery place, and um, they, they gave us presents. And I opened up my present, and it was a remote control car. Ooh, yeah, it was, it was nice, and I, I liked it. But then I looked over, and a friend got a watch. And in my eyes, the watch looked nicer than my car. In my eyes, I felt like there was an injustice that I got the car. He got the watch. So, because he's my buddy on the way home, we begin to talk. <laughs> Friend, this car, it's amazing. I got this remote, and it actually drives, and I think you'd like this. <laughs> and my friend's like, yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. But I, I like my watch, but tell me more about your car. So I, I keep telling him, and I, and I tell him about all the cons of having a watch. Come on, it's just a watch. Do you see where I'm going with this? By the end of our road together, I had offered him to call him Big Brother. Uh, in Korea, we, when you're friends, you, you're just friends, you call them by name. When you are, are older, you call them by a big brother name. So I say, listen, I am going to offer you from today on, if you switch gifts with me, I'll call you big brother. I'm going to call you young. And with that, the deal was done. We shook hands, exchanged gifts, and proudly I walked home with a watch on my wrist. Now, as silly as that sounds... It is the fallenness of man that always wants to compare and look over. The, grease is, the, the grass is greener on the other side. Well, for me, I think the, the well-watered grass is greener. You don't need to compare yourself with others. Like I've mentioned before, do you know that you are a masterpiece? You are a masterpiece of God, loved by God, destined by God. But in this particular case, the two brothers have this rivalry. And this theme of rivalry continues in the book of Genesis. Ishmael persecutes Isaac. Jacob leaves home so Esau can't kill him. Joseph's brother intend to kill him but decide to sell him as a slave. Right? Sin is the cause of all of this dysfunction. But what is the answer to this sin? 
I believe it comes in the next point, which is two worshippers. Let's go to verse 2 and keep reading in verse 2. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Cain and Abel worship God through bringing an offering to him. Now, of course, at this time, uh, we don't know if there were any kind of Levitical laws, but bringing an offering is a good thing. Worshiping God is a good thing. But there's a difference between these two worshipers. Now, in Sunday school, growing up, I learned from my Sunday school teachers, God bless them, you know, it's, it's because Cain brought just fruits and vegetables, you know, produce of the land. And Abel brought the, the good stuff. It's, a, you know, the firstborn animal. And that's not a bad idea. But let me present to you that Abel gave a better sacrifice, not because of the sacrifice itself, but it was the heart issue. The heart of bringing something to God. The heart behind why we give to God. And you can see that in how Abel prepared his gift. The fat portions of an animal is the best part. Anybody like meat? Yeah, the fat portions are the best. And, and when you roast it on a campfire, it smells good too. But think of it. Both offerings given to God... Abel gives the offering by faith. Cain gives the offering with a lack or no presence of faith. It is just doing because you're doing it. To us today, it's a Sunday morning, and if you're a Christian, a Christ follower, you love Jesus, you know that you come to church and worship him. God bless you. Praise the Lord. For those tuning in, God bless you. Well done. Good. But not just out of habit, not just out of ritual, but what is your heart as you enter into his presence to worship him? Your heart posture is so important because God is the one who looks at the heart. God is the one who is most interested in your heart posture. Have you come with expectation this morning that the word of God can give life to that which was dead? Have you come with expectation that God, in a hopeless situation, can still give you hope? Have you come to God with that expectation that in an impossible situation, God can provide a way forward? God is looking for those faithful ones to come to him and worship him in spirit and in truth. What I believe from the text and also uh, reading from Hebrews 11.4, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Faith. Have you come to the Lord with faith this morning? A heart posture that he is able to do above and beyond all that we can imagine. He is able to open up the Red Sea for his people. He is able to bring water into the desert. He is able to rain down cornflakes, manna, uh, food from heaven for the Israelites. He is able to heal the sick, to deliver those who are in bondage. He is able to bring those people who are so far, far away and bring them into the presence and into the countenance of God. He is able to save a wretch like me. He is able. The faith. He is looking for faith. He is looking for those who come to God. And by the way, some of you think, well, the, the sacrifice Abel brought, it seems a little bit clumsy or it seems a little bit, you know, kind of not well put together. Think about it. Fat portions of the firstborn sacrifice would have been pretty bloody. On the other hand, a clean, made-up fruit basket, maybe? Looks much more nicer on the outside. But again, 
the emphasis is not on the sacrifice itself. A better sacrifice is the sacrifice of the heart that is totally turned over to God. The heart issue. Corazón. In my heart. What is in there? Do I come to God so that I can boss him around? God, make this happen, this happen, this happen, and that happen. And if you don't make it happen, or, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be upset with you, God. I'm going to go to another God and worship the stone God or the moon God or the star God. But if you think about it, all those gods, they have a creator, the creator God. So these two worshippers come. One is looked with favor. And look in the text. Uh, and this is what really brings us hope. The Lord looked with favor on Abel. Verse 4. God doesn't first look at the offering. He first looks at the person. God does not look at how much you bring to him. But it's the quality of the heart. With a humble heart, with a broken heart, with a contrite heart, we bring to him our offering. We give to him our worship. Lord, have your way. Not my will, but yours be done. That's a wonderful prayer. Not my will, but yours be done, as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Many a times we have people who profess to be Christians, but they want to be the boss of their own lives and want God to help them in every endeavor that they do. That is not Christianity, friends. It is a false belief that somehow God is like a genie in a bottle. It's called idol worship. And we must take down all the idols and lift up the name of Jesus, the only one who came to this earth. The only one who laid down his life, a sinless sacrifice that would give of himself for the salvation of many. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, verse 5, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Do not contest the word of God. This is God's prerogative. God sees the heart and he weighs it and he's able to know which that is real and substantial and genuine. And then he also knows people who just go through the rituals, go, to, go through the rites. Yep, do it, done it. Okay, I'm a Christian. It doesn't work that way. Do you have the fruit of a Christ follower? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit just exploding in you with love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control? Against such things there is no law, the Bible says just welling up within our soul. This is God's judgment. It's not about the offering. It's about the heart of the worshiper. And Abel's heart, God receives. Cain's heart, God rejects. It is God's prerogative. It's his sovereignty. But one thing I found interesting here, as we think about the whole redemptive plan of the Bible, Abel... It was one lamb for one man. And then at the Passover, it is one lamb for one whole family. And then at the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, it is one lamb for the whole nation. And then come to Jesus Christ. It is one lamb for the whole humankind. This is God's plan. This is God's heart for you and for me. His love, his grace, his forgiveness. Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Now today we can come to Jesus. And he has already offered up a better sacrifice himself. And whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You may have lived a life of Cain until now. You may have lived out of just self-focused ideas. You may have lived out of self-centered ideas. You may have been living in sin that nobody ever knew about. Today you can come to the one lamb, Jesus Christ, 
and he offers us true forgiveness and life and hope through him. So we come to the two destinies after the two worshipers. Let's go on and read how Cain responds at the end of verse 5. Let's focus there. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And it continues with the conversation with Cain and God. Cain is upset. He's angry. He's angry to the point of wanting to kill Abel. Now, you might find this really, uh, you know, just how can that be? It's the Bible, the holy word of God. But I love that God doesn't just take out the gruesome parts or take out the stuff that, that uh, we don't understand. But I'm grateful that all of these accounts are recorded in the word of God to show us don't you sometimes feel that way like Cain? When the person that you've been working with for over 10 years, they get the promotion and you don't. When you know the person that got the promotion was the guy that was spending more time at the cooler, stealing staplers from the office. You know that guy who's been doing bad things and he or she gets the promotion and you don't. How do you feel? You feel like that there's been an injustice against you. Why does God bless evil people, or it seems like? Why do evil people succeed? Two destinies. It looks like Cain has succeeded. Why? Abel is dead. His rival, he has killed off. And in the eyes of the physical it seems like God is unfair, even letting Cain live. But to all those questions, I submit to you that the destiny of Abel is the destiny of the voice that still speaks, even though it is physically dead. It is a voice that continues to speak because it is a spiritual voice of truth. Do you know that Abel faced the destiny of becoming the first martyr in the Bible? The first person to give himself for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of giving good worship that was acceptable to God, and for that he was killed, not just persecuted, killed by his own brother. And the Bible talks to us clearly that his voice still speaks today. I love that about God. God doesn't miss a thing. In the sight of the world, we may look like losers, but in the end, we have God's victory on our side. In the world, they might say, well, you guys are just old-fashioned people that look at a very old document, and you believe, and you believe in this triune God stuff, and, you, and by the way, you guys are so nice too. You give food to the hungry, look after the poor. and But anyways, you guys are foolish, right? I mean, that's how they end it all the time, right? It doesn't matter what they say. It matters how God sees us. And what God's word says about Abel is this. Again, Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. And he still speaks. You can physically murder one of God's children, but you can't silence their voice that cries out for life. Life. Abundant life. We need to open up our eyes to the spiritual reality that God's voice is continuing to be spoken through the martyrs of today. There are people who are dying today because of their faith, being persecuted, being killed off, everything being taken from them but their voice still speaks, just like the blood and the voice of Abel. And by the way, my church that I grew up in in South Korea, 
the South Korean church is based on the martyrs of the missionaries that came from your land. And some of you, your land is not here, but it's somewhere else. It's okay, we're here today. So your land, this land, this area, people who were so gung-ho for God and wanted to spread the word of God to the nations, some people landed on our country. And do you know what our people did? They killed them. They killed them. I still remember the story. The missionary that came and he was carrying Bibles. He said, "Just you know, Jesus loves you. And he was trying to give them Bibles. And they just killed him. And they picked up the Bibles. And one of them, one of the killer, killers, yeah, he, he went home and used the Bible as wallpaper without even knowing what's, what's on this, right? And then after a couple of years, somebody that knows the language of what the Bible was written in back then, I think it was Chinese, says, this is the Holy Bible. A killer surrounded by the Word of God. A killer, a murderer, surrounded by the truth of God's word, not knowing it, until somebody comes and says, that's the word of God. And then the Spirit of God falls upon this person with conviction and said, I was the person that killed that, that missionary. And that person who was a persecutor of the church becomes one of the most greatest leaders of one of the Korean revivals. The blood of Abel still speaks. The blood of Jesus still speaks. It doesn't matter what the world says about our faith in Christ. It doesn't matter what the world says about our faith in the anchoring of ourselves in God's truth and God's scriptures. We must hear that voice of life and respond to it with amen. Yes, Lord. Yes and amen. Have your way. So one destiny is the destiny of the voice continuing to speak life, the destiny of Abel. The other is the destiny of Cain. Cain, who prided himself in his own self-righteousness. Cain, who lives on physically but is dead spiritually. Cain, who lives in perpetual fear, always looking over his shoulder, while Abel rests and lives on forever in the bosom of his father. Cain, his descendants, in verse 17 of the chapter, we don't have time to study it today, but I recommend you read in verse 17, at the end of the verse, we read this, Cain was then building a city, he named it after his son Enoch. They're building for themselves out of pride. The sin building continues. And do you know what? After Adam, there is a line that goes through Cain, but also there's a line that goes through Seth. And the, the seventh descendants of Adam that come through Cain is a guy called Lamech. And the seventh descendant in the line of Seth is a person named Enoch. Lamech, we find in the Bible, he's the one who actually kills somebody for intimidating him. And he boasts about it. Look what I have done. He talks to his two wives. Look what I have done. I have killed a man. Because they looked at me the wrong way. I'm paraphrasing, okay? Because they got on my nerves. They cut in in front of me. I killed a man. Look how strong I am. Look how I can control the situation. That is the destiny of sinful man. Sin begets sin begets sin. But the line of the righteous, Seth, begets seventh generation Enoch who walks with God. And that's where we're going to go next week. So you must come back. Let's wrap up today's message. Are we giving God a better sacrifice? A sacrifice of a broken heart? A sacrifice that has faith to trust him with everything that we have? Are we going to approach God and say, Lord, I, I really have nothing to give, but would you receive this sacrifice of praise? Would you receive this song? 
And God, you know I'm, I'm not very good at singing or dancing, but would you just receive me as I am? Just as I am. Just as I, just as I am. Can I just come to you, Lord? Because listen, my children, as they come to me, they're not the best dancers or the best singers or the best writers or the best drawers. But to me, they are the best. And those who come under the blood of Jesus, you are the best in his eyes. You are beloved. You are embraced. You're a masterpiece. So what is your gift to God this morning? What is your sacrifice to God this morning? What things do we have to just lay down before him? Don't worry about anybody else. Don't compare yourself with anybody else. You come just as you are to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and resurrected King. In Hebrews 11.6, we read this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. My prayer for our church is that we would earnestly seek the Lord by faith, not by any other motivation, but by faith we come. Lean into what God is doing here. Lean into the scriptures. Lean into the truth. And it might feel like you're always getting behind and the evil people are always getting ahead. Listen, though Cain lives physically, spiritually, he is dead. That's his destiny. Though Abel is physically dead, his spirit still lives on for all eternity. His voice still speaks to you. It's pounding on your hearts today. Life, everlasting life through the blood of Jesus. Is your sacrifice of faith pleasing to God this morning? And are we ready to host God's great glorious riches that we can give out to the nations? Not only those in Danvers and the North Shore, Essex County, not only in New England, but to the nations that we will be blessed to bless nations. I'm praying for that day. I'm praying for that Genesis revival to begin with me first and then spread like a wildfire. And do you know why I like fires? I like to roast my marshmallows. <laughs> and do you know why I like marshmallows? Because I can share it with other people. Share it. Share the goodness. Share the good news. Share Jesus. A better sacrifice. Let us pray as the worship team comes up. Oh Lord, the voice of Abel still speaks and we thank you that we have a model of a righteous sacrifice filled with faith. May our hearts today be warmed to this truth. Lord, I pray that we would not gloss over this chapter but as we go home this week, we would study this chapter in our own devotional times and drink deeply from that well of truth. Transform us to be more like you. Help us to be more loving. Help us to become love in the way we interact with one another, in the way we interact with the world. Help us to become Christ-like so that they would begin to know the love that we have experienced. So God, we give you all the praise. Glory and honor belongs to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.